Good evening, everyone. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming for Planet Word. Welcome to tonight's discussion of the revolution of the Chinese language with Jing Tu. Uh, I want to encourage you all to come visit Planet Word in person if you haven't had the chance to do that yet. We love that you're participating virtually. We absolutely thank you for that support, especially if you're already a member of Planet Word. Uh, but if you get the chance to come on down to 13th and K in downtown Washington, that's the building behind me, the historic Franklin School, would love to see you. Uh, with that, thank you for being here. And I am delighted uh, to welcome Jing Su. She is a professor of East Asian languages and literatures and comparative literature and chair of the Council on East Asian Studies at Yale. The book, which is going to disappear because of the background I'm using, is Kingdom of Characters. And you can buy it through a bookshop.org link. Um, that supports both Planet Word and independent bookstores. Jingsu, thank you for being here. Welcome to Planet Word. Thank you so much for having me, Rebecca. What a pleasure. Uh, so this book is a fairly massive undertaking that you've managed to compress into, you know, something like 280 pages. Um, and I thought, um, you know, we've got a word nerd audience here. We're a word museum. So I think a lot of the challenges to modernizing Chinese are linguistic. Um, a lot of them are logistical, a lot of them are political, a lot of them are cultural, obviously those fields all overlap. But I thought it might be interesting to sort of go through some of the challenges and how they were solved. Um, you structure the book chronologically, but it ends up sort of being, uh, you know, a nested series of problems to solve anyway. Um, and I wanted to just start with sort of the basic fact that seems obvious, but actually I think ultimately is the underlying challenge of all of it, which is that Chinese is character driven. Um, and there are thousands of characters, they're very hard to learn. Um, they are uh, hard to learn to read. They are even harder to learn to, re to write. Uh, for a long time, literacy was the privilege of the elite. Um, so I was hoping you could sort of start with characterizing the characters of Chinese and so all the different ways before we even get to, you know, building a typewriter for them that presents a challenge to the modern age. Yes, in fact, a really good place to start is probably starting with our English alphabet, the Western alphabet. You have 26 letters and in some ways even more important than that it comes in a certain successive order, right? You have B that always comes after A, um, S comes before T. So there's a very distinct order that we often take for granted such that, you know, we can actually use ABC to organize systems of knowledge. We use it to make up a shopping list. We can use the list priorities, you know, to say is the ABCs or someone's on the A list or on the B side, you know, or so these, these different ways in which we organize our life and everyday life priorities with the alphabet system. Now imagine that in the Chinese writing, uh, writing system, you have tens of thousands of characters and there's definitely no 26 letters. And each of the characters are not arranged in parts that are successive. If you look at it, it's more like in a, in a space of a square shape. So it's not like a string of letters, but rather a, a square shape where there are clusters of shapes that are kind of nestled inside one another. And these parts that are nestled inside are not necessarily, not necessarily repeatable or you know, recyclable the way that the alphabet letters are. So that sort of creates a huge problem when you're trying to understand how much time would one have to spend in one's lifetime just to learn this writing system. I mean, I for one, when I was growing up, in you know, the way we learn character writing is actually you were given anywhere between 12 to 36 or 40 characters a day. And I would just go home and re write them out in 30, 40 times. So I can commit to, men's, to muscle and mental memory as to how these characters are written in what order. And the order is important. And I, I think that's another thing that um, people who grow up speaking a language with a Romanized alpha, alphabet don't really think through that, you know, and you make the point in the book, if you really want to start your capital A with the crossbar, no one's stopping you. But if you start a Chinese character with a different stroke, you could end up really getting it wrong. Yes, in fact, I got my knuckle, you know, sort of hit on <laughs> my teacher for trying to learn it like the, the cheating way. And it's very true also because Chinese is a, is, comes out of a tradition of, you know, millennial old tradition of calligraphy. So there's our very strong 
um, I think prestige and learnedness that comes with actually how to write characters and the way you execute the strokes, what we call strokes, which is basically kind of a, any line you can make on a page without lifting the tip of your pen. So Chinese characters are made of what would look like these, you know, basically sticks, sometimes dots, and all these are kind of different lengths of strokes. And so characters are made up of strokes fundamentally. Um, and you also make the point in the book, and, and as a monolingual English speaker, this really made me think, even though we say all the time at Planet Word how tied language is to culture, that the fact that we order our alphabet in a certain way, even if it's arbitrary, really does lead to sort of a cultural worldview. Uh, you mentioned expressions like being on the, you know, the A-list. It There's something about that order that is more than just a mapping tool. and not having an analog in another language has its own cultural implications. You know, they're, they're, that's actually a great question and a great observation because in many ways, they are social theorists and philosophers in the 20th century that took what you just said even a step farther and say that the reason that an alphabet only has 26 letters, that the way that it is, is actually the reason why things like mathematics or scientific revolution happened in the West rather than the East because 26 letters lend themselves so readily just as a phonetic tool to learn language that pretty soon you can just kind of dispense with having to learn how to write and instead engage in abstract thinking, so on and so forth. So there's an entire debate that lasted for centuries about why the English language or the alphabetic language is actually superior and more amenable to science and technology. Whereas Chinese characters kind of like Arabic, I mean, same argument been made in both contexts where it just becomes sort of cumbersome, you know, a way an elite way of writing the past, you know, where, cumulative knowledge acquired over long periods and at a slow leisurely pace were a hallmark of, of, of distinction. But in the 20th century where everything is about speed, precision, technological change, that is no longer the case. And it was interesting to me how early on a lot of these efforts at simplifying or systematizing Chinese came into play, that, it, that this wasn't a computer age issue. Um, and also, and I suppose I sort of knew this intellectually, but learned it more thoroughly in your book that there was a question of which Chinese, right? There, I mean, there's so many dialects and um, variations that if you're, before you even talk about the method, you have to choose which version. Yeah, absolutely. And if I can transfer you back in time, imagine being one of the first Jesuit missionaries that landed fresh in China from Rome. And what you had to do is kind of, you better assimilate quickly and communicate with the local population because really what you want to do is spread the word of God. And so the problem was the Chinese you heard was kind of the whatever dialect and region you were in. So these early missionaries were actually very indebted to them because they're the ones who first transcribed the Chinese they heard into Romanized systems, right? Using their alphabetic letters. And so we have these early examples of how to actually pronounce the Chinese in, in Latinization. But of course, we can't really make heads or tails of them because many of them from regional dialects that we don't really exactly know how, how, what they heard exactly. And not to mention the French, the German, Italian missionaries used their own systems. So it was like all a huge mess, even though we had this early encounter between Chinese character writing system and alphabet letters, there was not really a systematic way of representing. And that became kind of key for 20th century, right? It was all about standardization. What is the one standard that could unify all these spoken Chinese dialects? And how did Mandarin sort of become what people were shooting for in that standardization? Well, there's one reason why this book, you know, you're right, there's a long, complicated history and it's very sprawling, you know, basically more it than- It has some really topics. interesting characters in it along the way. Exactly, and that's why it was intentionally to, to get people through this complicated and technical history, I decided to tell it through these range of really remarkable human characters and innovators, hacks, copycats, you know, revolutionaries, fugitives, who really led- You're the, a librarian. <laughs> my life, that's actually my favorite character, my Bismarck Du. He named himself Bismarck Du because he wanted to rule the field of library science with a <laughs> fist. But the man who actually was responsible for Beijing Mandarin, or what is became, you know, a century later, or what we now think of as Putonghua, so it's a common speech, the standard speech of Chinese, is with this man named Wang Zhao, who in 1900 
you know, snuck around the, the border from, um, he was in Japan, ex in exile in Japan. He was a wanted fugitive and he stole across the court to come back, the border to come back to China, disguised as a Buddhist monk from Taiwan, which back then was like an outpost. Nobody knew, you know, really traveled to Taiwan so he could claim that he was from there. And Wang Zhao is one of these last generation of Mandarins, like really the elite Mandarins who was loyal to the last dynasty and empire. He did not want to topple the empire. So he did not really foresee this radical revolution in 1911 that basically ended the imperial order in China and began modern nationhood as we know it. And you know, he was with this group, he wanted the Chinese empire to survive, but he knew, he saw that language was gonna be a huge stumbling block because the Chinese couldn't even communicate amongst themselves with all these dialects, let alone trying to educate, read the same thing and translate Western knowledge, so on and so forth. So his big feat was, and if you read, and when you read chapter one, you'll understand that uh, he, he was not a very likable character. I, I would not want to have him as a colleague because very stubborn, curmudgeonly, um, very grumpy and ungenerous in many, many ways. But it took a personality like that. So he came back and he decided he's gonna, he's going to propose and gonna implement and, and disseminate this Mandarin phonetic alphabet that he came up with. Basically using 50 or so very uh, simplified version of what was originally Chinese characters to represent certain sounds, right? So he was basically trying to create an alphabet for Chinese where you can sort of combine, splice them together in a way that would kind of reproduce characters. And he actually, you know, the, the interesting thing about Chinese script revolution, language revolution, was that it was not really a Chinese affair. You know, there were Europeans who were in on, in, in on the quest, you know, French explorers, so on and so forth. But more importantly, also the regional stakeholders. So part of the system was taken from the Japanese Kana system, which itself is kind of a phonetic system used to translate foreign, transcribe foreign languages. So the Japanese also imported, their first language system was actually Chinese character writing. In fact, before there was, before there was a Western alphabet in Asia, Chinese was the ABCs of the region. The Koreans used it, the J Japan used it, and also Vietnam, Vietnam, who actually the Vietnamese used Chinese characters as kind of literally like a phonetic alphabet to yeah composed, but also to transcribe the own sounds in their language. So, you know, Chinese, you know, in some ways, one of the stories is that how much language actually has in different language systems have actually in common. And so the way that we oppose Chinese to alphabet, kind of like the way we oppose China to, you know, the West, is really kind of a false dichotomy. Um, so let's turn to the technology of the 20th century that sort of forced some of these issues. The typewriter, right? If you want to disseminate information, want to increase literacy, want to have printed material available more widely, it can't all be handwritten. And it certainly can't all be beautifully calligraphy handwritten. Um, but if you've got a language of thousands of characters, how do, how do you make a typewriter? That's a great question. And certainly when this came up in the late 19th century, the first person who invented a Chinese language typewriter was actually not Chinese. It was this American Presbyterian missionary. So, you know, foreigners outside really play a key role because they were able to see Chinese language differently than the native speakers did. And this man developed Zelato Sheffield, a great name. He, of course, as you would think, just expected, okay, I have to build a very large kind of type printing system. And so you look at this picture, which is in my book, it's not like what you would think of typewriter now. It didn't have this nice external keyboard, a QWERTY keyboard. He basically constructed a kind of flat disc drum-like, you know, this cumbersome machine where you have to, on the one hand, roll the disc, the disc and then line it up with these levers and pulls in order to, you know, print it on the page. So it's like a very cumbersome, I, I imagine to be a, like a full body acrobatic <laughs> to <laughs> right. you know, exercise this, you know, this wheel that you're kind of like rolling around all the time. And so that was the first try. And his idea was, well, yes, of course, one key per character, right? That's a non-starter, of course, because the Chinese character has to be seen whole. Now, this is a critical issue. This is the, the main change um, that happened but you know that that happened later in the 20th century, because 
Of course, it makes sense that Chinese characters come in holes, like we just talked about, right? These character writing, square character writing. And the, the, the issue with Chinese character is traditionally there's only one part. So Chinese is usually seen as an indivisible whole and is usually tagged or identified by this one part called radical. So when this man in, you know, way back centuries ago, decided to take inventory, the first inventory of all the characters out there, which he then, he kind of counted around, you know, less than 10,000. You know, he realized that some characters have these, they share similar parts. So there's a, some, some character component that occurs through, you know, across a number of characters. And he said, oh, that's an easy way to tag this group of characters by their shared part. So, you know, that's sort of as far as Chinese went because then Chinese otherwise is indivisible whole. But then what the typewriter innovators realize because they have to fit this on a Western keyboard. Why is that? Because that's just the infrastructure that was given to them. So a lot of book is about, you know, the Western technology, alphabet technology really had a first mover's advantage in creating these, what became global communications technology, right? Telegraphy, Morse code, which was really for alpha, dots and dashes for alphabet letters. And then the typewriting system, which is kind of reliant on a keyboard that basically has one letter per key. And so, you will read, read about this in chapter four and two about how this happened. But essentially, so the giveaway is they realized that they could figure out, they figure out a way to break down characters into parts that you can then use to recombine and basically recycle and then sort of put them back together as characters. Now, here's a beautiful part about this idea. It turns out when you break down a character into its components, what's called, and a component is kind of like a cluster of strokes that make up, sometimes they're kind of like simpler characters. A char one character on the average would have about between two or four of these components. So in other words, if you then map these components onto a keyboard, what it means is to type a Chinese character, you only need to tap around two or four times, like two or four keys on your keyboard. Now, an English word on the average is closer to five letters per word on the average, which means that if you would use a typewriting keyboard for Chinese, you can actually use it to type Chinese faster than you can for the English alphabet for which the, type, <laughs> the typewriting keyboard is actually designed for. So this is kind of the beautiful part where these, these innovators ingeniously thought a way of piggybacking on alphabetic infrastructure so that they don't have to reinvent the, the wheel on their own. We have a question in the chat about how many radicals are there, which is not actually a simple answer. It is not because it has grown and you know contracted over time. So there was there was more than five hundred, then it was trimmed out to four, and now there's two hundred. And this is so that also has been inconsistent. If you if I were to draw like a graph of how you know Chinese characters have been. Um, uh, I think grouped or organized over time, it really kind of would go up and down because their periods were, for instance, there were 80,000 characters and then try to trim it down to 40. And characters too, I mean, the, the radical that you're talking about were also different in the sense that some people thought less did more and other people differ. Um, we have another question asking, were Japanese hiragana or katakana or something similar ever incorporated into written Chinese? Well, so hiragana and katakana are part of the kana syllabary. So these symbols, if you look at them, they're actually derived from character writing, which was the first writing system that the Japanese used. But the Japanese also realized that, of course, if you listen to Japanese, the way that, a, for instance, the same character um, in Chinese will be pronounced completely differently in Japanese. And in fact, over time, so the characters using Japanese writing system kind of morph. So they're called kanji. And so the, the hiragana and katagana are kind of two additional systems outside of written Chinese. They were never quite re-imported back to China, but the inspiration of ideas were phoneticizing using phonetic symbols, right, that were derived from Chinese to phoneticize Chinese. That idea was experimented with early on in the 20th century. In fact, that's what I grew up with. So if you grew up in mainland China, you actually learn using Roman letters, the pinging system. That's how you first learn Chinese, sort of via the alphabetic route, because the idea is that you, if you know what something sounds like, that helps literacy. And I learned it through using these symbols called bopomofo, which I talk about in the book as well. And these symbols are, are kind of, they're the phonetic, of this about 36, 38 symbols. And they're derived kind of like hiragana and katakana from character writing originally. 
So, you know, to my ear, they sound more natural when I was growing up than looking at in terms of alphabet letters. You talked about this sort of identifying the radical as a the starting component and a, a sort of piece of the character that could be pulled out in order to simplify the typewriter. But um, there's an added complication there too, as I understand it. The radical doesn't always appear in the same place or in the same size or even in the same form. Um, so it's not like a big old capital letter if that's what people are imagining. I'm so glad you picked that up. In, in fact, of all, of all the conversation I had about this, we're, you're the first one to actually pick up on that because that was a huge stumbling block because what we don't appreciate is that the you know, Chinese writing system really kind of like is a cumulative organic product. You know, there are lots of kind of the quirks about it. That's just a matter of how the, right, the habits of writing evolved over time. And when you're really trying to systematize it, it's actually it's a huge problem. Right? When I talk about how you know, the same radical or the same character for fire, for instance, can appear utterly different depending on where the characters come from. So you're right in the sense that my, my, my typewriting inventors came up with the ideas of, okay, we can break Chinese down to ABCs and recompose them, but actually how to materialize that so that the characters you put together actually look right, right? Instead of lopsided or kind of superimposed on one another, they actually are in the position where they're supposed to be. That was a unique problem that Chinese typesetters, you know, even in the 1960s when thinking about computerizing, how do you, you know, type in a character and have it pop up on your, as a font on your screen the right way, that took an enormous amount of work. So I think people also just fail to appreciate for Chinese to get itself on a level footing as the Western alphabet took tremendous, tremendous effort. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned pinyin, the sort of representing of Chinese with uh, Roman letters. And so for people who don't understand what I'm talking about, picture writing out Beijing, right? Um, that, I didn't understand how incredibly political that was. Um, I think maybe somewhere in the back of my mind, I'd heard that Chairman Mao was credited with it, but um, can you tell us a little bit more about that process? Actually, I'm so glad that you, you, you associate with Chairman Mao because that is the way we think about that. Mao accomplished two, he, uh, you know, he could lay claim to two great achievements uh, with regard to Chinese language. One was standardizing the way in which Chinese is Romanized. You remember, I just talked about all these missions. We have plenty of examples from past missionaries and also Chinese themselves coming up with different ways of phoneticizing. It was all a jumble. And there's no you know, one standard that fit all, but pinging was it. So we, so that's one of his accomplishments that's been credited to him. The other one that's been credited to him is the simplification of characters. So, you know, whenever I go get my hair cut, most of it consists of thinning out my hair. And so I always think of that as how a simplified character works because you basically thin it of strokes so that it becomes simpler and easier to learn and to manage. And so both were associated with post 49, but I also talk about in the book that was actually not true. So it turns out the simplification of characters for one was actually proposed originally undertaken by the nationalists in the early 20th century. As early as 1909, we had a proposal about, we need to simplify, use simplified characters, which were actually kind of used in every day, um, but just not in a formal system. And the nationalists actually proposed the first set of simplified characters in the 1930s, but because you know the first half of the 20th century was filled with revolutions and wars and you know foreign invasion, and the Chinese were busy surviving the war against the Japanese, the Second World War, not to mention their own civil war. So the atmosphere was never stable enough for any kind of meaningful language policy to be fully implemented. So the nations kind of left it, and it was really up to the communists, the first time that modern China had been united under one leadership, that then real language policies, the ones of a blasting impact, were able to be implemented. And I say this because I often like to point out that you know, so much of what we think about Chinese language system is very much colored and overshadowed by the 1949 split between the nationalists and communists. So these days you think of simplified characters as something what mainland use, whereas traditional characters is what Taiwan uses, which is a, which is a nationalist government or wh where they retreated to. And the point there is really that it's really because of political difference that the difference in their use of language also became very much um, uh, radicalized. 
So, you know, you kind of don't remember this history that they actually were basically on the same linguistic quest to modernize the Chinese language. Right, because you can see where the nationalists in Taiwan could associate the simplicity with communism, that there's almost an ideological overlap there. But if the nationalists had originally embraced simplifying the language as well, you can throw that out the window, I guess. Yeah, you know, these great counterfactuals, and I love these, I, I love asking these questions, you know, when I teach in class is, what would it happen if X had not taken place? Right, because essentially, you know, I think we in some ways we credit Mao with too much of the language, you know, modernization that had been underway for more than a century by his time. And more importantly, I also bring in there's a lot of unknown history that I weave into, you know, the part of the known history we know about Chinese language, which is also that Romanization had this other unacknowledged beginning in this small Sino Muslim community that basically were the descendants of these Muslims in northwest, uh, northwestern China that actually fled across the border in the last dynasty because they were persecuted by the Qing Empire. And so they settled in what's current day like Kazakhstan, uh, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. So they actually lived in a linguistic universe that was completely outside of all this national standardization, you know, all this fight between Romanization system and their writing system, because they were, they were illiterate peasants mostly, but they had a kind of North, they spoke a kind of dialect that actually is related to Mandarin, both from the North. And so their first writing system was actually given to them under the Soviet policy, you know, of multilingualism, multinationalism. So, or, you know, they allow each group, these ethnic groups to have their own language, but that's more of a policy for Central Asia, these Turkic groups that didn't really have their own writing systems. So these Chinese Muslims became folded under that project. So their first Romanization was actually given to them in a completely different uh, uh, context than what became Chinese, but the two then dovetailed because Post-49 China was also very influenced by their big socialist brother, the Soviets. Yeah, I, that surprised me was how involved the Soviets were in Chinese language and a whole sort of Bolshevik influence in all of that. It is, you know, linguistics history is such, it's, it's the most, I think, social history there is because it's so messy, it's so organic and it's so alive because it basically maps onto every kind of, you know, social or political change there is. Very sensitive measure for it. Um, we have a couple of questions in the, um, about Bopo Mofo. Um, was is it a Taiwanese teaching tool or was it used to teach in Chinese in the mainland as well? Well, it was implemented by the nationalists, so they brought it with them to Taiwan. So Bopomofo is not used on the mainland. It's pinging the, the Romanization system that's used there. And can you explain the difference? Well, the Bopomofo is this phonetic about the 36, 38 phonetic symbols I talked about, which is actually derived from Chinese writing itself. So it doesn't look like Roman letters. It looks more like, in some ways, more like Kiragana or Katagana. And it's a system that's actually more, uh, more intuitive for the Chinese to use in some ways um, at the time. But the idea that the one reason that people decide to go with Roman letters was because that was kind of the international system, right? So in some ways, Bopomofo might be more intuitive than other Romanization systems, but what China wanted to do, what was more expedient, right? So language, a lot of language, you know, uh, language policy is also about expediency, was just to simply get the Chinese as internationalized as possible. So we've talked about the challenges of representing a character-driven language on a keyboard and uh, in something that's regularized and square and all that. Um, we haven't talked about tones at all. Um, Chinese is a tonal language. And how does that get represented in print? Yes, and that is the greatest question because that points at the biggest trade-off in Romanizing Chinese. Now, I have to say, it was decided quite early on the 20th century because you know, in the late 19th century, the Chinese reformers were thinking, yeah, let's just do away with the Chinese character writing. It's so complicated. Why do we need to keep it around? But soon after that, people realized we're going to keep our writing system and Romanization is only going to be like an auxiliary system. Right, so there's no way to really replace Chinese. And one of the reasons because, so Chinese write, Chinese 
character, the Chinese language system, there's a lot of homophones. That is to say, a lot of characters, even though they look different, and when you look at them, if you know Chinese, you immediately know that's not what's meant, but they sound alike. So there are a few instances in English, but definitely not nearly as many as Chinese. For instance, um, the kernel of a corn, right, versus kernel like a general in the army. Right. So we have those kind of examples. When Chinese, there's just so many more. In fact, you know, my name, J I N G, it, you know, it doesn't signify, it doesn't tell you what tone it is. And it could be a, a whole range of Chinese characters in Chinese. But of course, only one is meant in my name. And so tones, the best way to explain it is really like a pitch. So, you know, we speak in tones all the time in English. We just don't recognize it. For instance, it's the difference between, let's say, if I say yes you know, kind of like in a question and yes, kind of emphatic. So if I had to map, if I were to map this out in with Chinese tones, yes will be kind of like a second tone that goes up and yes will be an emphatic tone that goes down. Except in Chinese, it doesn't mean that's different between being emphatic and being, you know, um, interrogatory. So tones are vitally important in Chinese language because it tells you in context what is meant, right? So, we represent a questioning tone with a question mark in our language. There are other languages that use accents or diacritical marks. Um, how is tone conveyed in Chinese? You just add another character. There's a whole <laughs> school of characters that do nothing except to signal like explanation, explanation like awe or you know, excitement or question mark. If I say, have you eaten? I would say, Ni, which is you, chi fan, eaten, or actually, literally eat rice, because that's what Chinese eat. So that just comes standing for rice. And I will say ma at the end, ni chi fan ma, ni chi le fan ma, have you eaten? So there's a, just another character at the end that tells you that it's a question. Um, I thought in your introduction to the book, you talked about learning English um, as a kid and missing those tones, feeling that it was sort of a drab language. Yeah, you know, it's really funny. I, you know, I, because I, you know, I'm an academic and I used to write academic books. This is my first trade book. So I'm really not comfortable in some ways inserting personal tone to my writing. And that actually, that personal anecdote came very late because a friend of mine was telling me, you know, you got to throw your readers a bone. I mean, this book is great. But <laughs> I'm thinking if I don't know Chinese, I'm like, okay, I got to really brace myself and grit my teeth through this book. So I thought when we were doing that simply by, you know, in some ways beating my readers halfway and to tell them what it was like for me to learn English, which was really, you know, you I definitely felt like I'd lost something in my relation to language and learn English, but I also gained a lot more. So there was, it was kind of, you know, when I was learning English, I remember there are no tones and there's kind of like no coloration in my mind because I was so used to interacting with, you know, a very visual language and also not in simplified form right, because I grew up in Taiwan. And so, you know, I, I still prefer to read Chinese poetry in traditional characters, because it's just like, it's so much more evocative in terms of imagery. You know, but English on the other hand, I remember one of the most striking thing was, to this day, it is absolutely impossible for me to curse in Chinese. I, I just, <laughs> just strike me, it's just very, I just, I can just never do it. But I would curse like a sailor, you know, when I first, within six months that I arrived, I would say things like, damn, and all this, that would just shock my, my classmates in, in the United States, or it was in LA and then in New Mexico, because it didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> so there's certain things that, you know, I have no emotive appeal, so I'm in some ways like, freer to be more like crass or more tom more, more tomboyish in English than I was in China. <laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> um, and I, so I think those of us who have learned like the incredible basics of what a tonal language means, we learn the example of ma in Chinese and you know, you, we, you say it wrong and it's or, you know, say it one way it's or, some one way it's mother. But I didn't realize that different dialects have more tones, different tones, extra tones. The tones yeah. aren't even standardized. You can have seven, you can have nine. In fact, you know, when you go down to the South, because standard Mandarin only has really four tones. You go down to the South, you can have anywhere between seven and nine. Like even when you listen to Cantonese when you're in Hong Kong, it's just a much more, there's just a lot more tonal fluctuation. And you know, same with even non-Chinese. If you go to Thailand, 
I mean, Thai has many tones and if you, even Swedish has certain kind of tonal qualities to it. So in some ways, the Western alphabet really kind of lost the kind of tonal quality, even though it's very much part of, if you're a French speaker, you know how important tones are, right? Or how you say something. Um, but also they've changed over time. Tones also change over time. And so what I talk about in this book, which is that it's not that, the Chinese, not that Chinese didn't have a native system for noting tones, but their system was using two characters to kind of spell out a third character, how it should sound, right? But the problem is, you know, there was nothing really objective about it because over time sounds drift. So both those characters that are supposed to be used as spellers for the third character, kind of like, you know, started diverging. And then before you know it, it doesn't make any sense how there's what they're supposed to sound together. And so that's why at the same moment when, you know, the Western alphabets were came to China through the, you know, thanks to the missionaries who were trying to basically peg a graft of tone because, you know, the end, end, in the end, that's what it is. Language is actually just a habit. There's nothing intrinsic about seeing a letter A that tells you it can only be associated with the sound A. So for very early on, you know, language is basically our first experience at socialization. You know, we give up, you know, lots of other possibilities of how something would sound like, and we learn and we internalize how a mark is supposed to be pronounced so that we can communicate with others. So we've got a lot of good audience questions, but I want to bring us up to the 21st century um, because we've talked about the challenges of learning to write Chinese, learning to represent it on a typewriter, learning to simplify it, learning to pronounce it, um, computing in Chinese, coding Chinese. Um, in some ways you think it would uh, be easier because you don't have to have the analog like literal key strike for every single imprint onto your paper through a typewriter ribbon. Um, but computers were not designed originally with something like a character-driven language in mind. So how did Chinese enter the computer age? That's right, because at every juncture, essentially, all these, if you think about what happened to telegraphy and typewriting, Chinese learned a hard lesson, which was, God, we always have this infrastructure that already exists that we have to somehow fit ourselves into, like, like shoes that don't fit. So like, it's all made for the alphabets. Same with computer, um, com computering um, languages, and which are computerizing languages, which is why Chinese vowed that they would not miss this technological wave. So in 1970, there was a project 748 that was a state-sponsored um, project on Chinese language information processing. Because at that time, as with United States elsewhere in the world, you know, the, the, this was the, the fourth, you know, great revolution, which was basically the information age. And China knew that if it didn't try to get a handle on this and really get in on it at the very beginning, it would miss out on yet another technological wave, much like it did in telegraphy and typewriting. And so they applied themselves to basically try to figure out how to represent Chinese in binary codes. And there were different ways of doing it. And it turns out this way of breaking characters down to components became quite important. And they figured out a way of basically using ways of coding Chinese. But of course that meant that you had to do several things. You have to make Chinese, uh, you have to delimit the size of it so it's manageable because all human script system actually that you use in computer now are actually coded on this platform called Unicode, which is called universal code. And universal code is essentially um, the, 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 the one writing system that takes up the largest space in Unicode, by far the ideographic writing system, that is the Chinese character writing system. And to, to, in some ways, this is a long, complex history that's where it talked about in the last chapter, so starting chapter six and chapter seven, because the idea of universalizing, right, to be true to its name, universal code, that these developers in Silicon Valley actually had to make sure that it applies to all languages. And Chinese, as usual, was the outlier. It was the litmus test to any kind of Western technology that claims that it can be universal. And so they went to China and they talked about how to, you know, work with characters and they try to represent characters in different ways because, you know, computer coding binary also has to do with the size of storage. So it's much easier to store a letter A, you know, or a letter B. You only need basically like a seven bit. 
But for Chinese, it just takes at least, it's, it's almost like twice as much storage space. So that was a huge deal where you had to think about how to compress character writing, how to make it fit, and then how to basically mobilize it. And you have this additional problem, which is what we talked about. You had historically for centuries, you had Japanese Japan's different use of Chinese characters, the Korean characters, the Vietnamese characters. So all these are kind of Chinese characters that kind of sort of they split and evolved in different ways because they were used by different communities. So one of the one of the remarkable things about coding Chinese is that there's an international group that does nothing but look at character writings. To this day, they meet twice a year to try to consolidate and try to bring in, you know, into this system, Unicode, all the Chinese characters out there, which are still being discovered, believe it or not. And because they had to figure out, okay, are these two characters basically the same or are they different? So you would think that this is kind of an easy process, but it's not. So imagine a room full of computer scientists, you know, programmers who are not linguists or sonologists, but are made to look at and scrutinize each character as though they were linguists. It's really kind of a remarkable story where I feel like Chinese character is still, it has a, it has a disproportional weight in global communications technology structure. Did you just say that Chinese characters are still being discovered? Well, because, okay, here's the thing. So when, universe, when, when Unico was first um, developed, they had designed the, 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 the originator, Joe Becker, um, who still lives in, in California. Um, so it was really intended for modern languages, right? Modern scripts. Now remember, Chinese has this very long, very distinguished, very voluminous, you know, written tradition. And so, you know, once there was these modern characters in use, it was not quite enough because Chinese also wants to computerize all its written records. So then you have these like really old texts are constantly being rediscovered, not to mention all the ethnic, you know, groups and their writing systems and older texts. So in fact, there's kind of these, there's these new characters in the pipeline that are constantly being, you know, proposed for examination. And in fact, at the, at the IRG, this, this group is called the Ideographic Rapporteur Group, although they just changed their name to call, to be called Ideographic Graphic research group, because it's clear that they were not temporary rapporteurs. It was going to take them probably a lifetime to do. You know, they were calculating how many hundreds of years it would actually take for them to try to get through this pipeline. <laughs> um, so we are language nerds here at Planet Word. And so um, I've really concentrated sort of on the, the details of the language, but I I want to sort of talk about what's what was at stake, right? Uh, the the subtitle of the book is "The Language Revolution That Made China Modern." Um, what what was the alternative? I mean, what would have happened otherwise? Well, if China had forgone its writing system, it would have become an alphabetic language. But that would mean that essentially it would have no real edge in the current technology system. Now, what you have now is because of this important process of the 20th century, where it got Chinese into the computer, into Unicode. So that first process of getting Chinese into the computing age was the door that would open to all doors. And without it, you know, Chinese wouldn't have an edge that it has now in areas of AI, natural language processing, which is a very important part of deep learning and AI research. And it wouldn't have this advantage of basically creating its own linguistic context and atmosphere and environment. Essentially, China is able to begin to build what I had wanted in the 70s, but was too poor and too under equipped to do so, which was basically create an ecology, an entire ecosystem that is, is geared and designed for its own language and its own language use. Um, so I want to get to some of these audience questions because there's some good ones. Um, somebody asks, how did it happen that China has one uniform written language, but so many regional dialects? I know it's not extraordinary. And, you know, the, the first Western explorers, European explorers who went to China, in fact, they really awed at that fact because Europe was just the opposite, right? And it's really because, you know, the, the Chinese character writing system also was standardized at some point. And that is the only way that different speakers could communicate. So that's why the writing system was the stabilizing factor and it ensured that an empire as vast, as large and multilingual in many ways. And I say multilingual because, you know, we talk about dialects, but these are basically all languages. 
right? You have certain, like, there are dialects where it's as, you know, as hard to understand as French and Spanish when you hear them. And so this idea is really only this, this linguistic diversity had to be held together somehow. And it's really the power of the written word. But of course, the written word was also not given to everyone. As you said, it was very, it, the, the power of the word was reserved for the elite for centuries until the modern age. And uh, there is still that element of um, the power of calligraphy. It is still very important, ceremonial, considered um, a mark of power. Yes, and certainly cultural legitimacy. I mean, it's really considered, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of the book, very few countries where you see the head of state having to dash off, you know, his name or a couple of auspicious sayings with calligraphy. It's a very kind of a, because, you know, writing traditionally has been associated with authority. And there's actually some, an additional philosophical weight to the Chinese writing system. So, you know, the, the, the mythological origin, the philosophical origin has been narrated in the following that a four-eyed sage, you know, who invented character writing, um, basically developed a character as something that is in harmony with the order that you see in the cosmos. So the story goes that he looked up at the clouds and examined the patterns of cloud formation. And he looked down on the ground and see the tracks left by birds, you know, on sand, walking on sand. And for him, that the entire, that the natural world was used, was ruled and governed by certain patterns um, and repetitions. And so from that, he was inspired to then develop a writing system, a symbolic system for humans that actually was in conformity with these laws. Mm. Now, I want to de, you know, demystify this a little bit because, and here I get to talk about a little bit what led me to write this book. So about five, six years ago, I was really, because, you know, in Chinese studies, you always hear about 100 years of humiliation, uh, China was backward, took all this time to catch up, and so much was blamed on the language itself that I was really had to ask, is it really that much more taxing? Is it really that much harder to learn ideographic writing system than that's an alphabetic writing one, uh, alphabetic system? So it led me to seek out these neuroscientists who were working on the science of reading. And it was mind blowing because, you know, when you look at writing system, writing system is only 5,000 years old. So evolutionary speaking, there's no way that we could have evolved fast enough as a species with a specific neural capacity just to read written language. So it turns out that this ability is actually a refinement and it's actually built on an earlier, more primitive infrastructure in our neural circuit that's actually adapted to seeing patterns in the world, seeing shapes, because, you know, like, like orienting ourselves in, in, in the environment, like, you know, whether to hunt or to find our way home, you have to recognize certain patterns that, you know, would, would cue us to where we're supposed to go. So what's really bizarre is that they talk about these shapes and patterns, and it just so happened this conforms almost 100% to this story of the four-eyed sage that I was telling you about, that it is about patterns in nature that actually inspired writing. So to me, that was actually mind-blowing, right? So it kind of like just come full circle with this kind of almost like a mythical um, um, story about writing came to be, which I thought was always kind of a very quixotic way, like a story that parents tell their children when they go to bed. It turns out that it actually also conforms with what neuroscientists now think and have proven to be the case. That's interesting. We had someone in the chat say over 1 billion people read and write Chinese. It can't be that bit difficult. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, you, it's true. I think it's all learn. a matter of habit. I mean, I would not, I personally would not want to learn Chinese if I hadn't acquired as a native language because it is darn difficult. I think, you know, just learning the written characters. I mean, I see my students all the time where they come to Yale the first year, they don't learn any Chinese. And, but in four years, they end up, you know, being native speakers. So it's pretty extraordinary how a difficult language can be much less difficult to learn now just because you're kind of accustomed to it, right? So it's really relative. Um, somebody asks, why is Chinese written vertically instead of horizontally? Um, that, I think, that is just an evolution of, of things. In fact, the, the verticality is so strong that when a kind of descendant of Arabic script came across Eurasia to, to China, you know, Arabic is actually written horizontally. It actually verticalized itself. 
And so this is what you have, the, the, Mon the Manchu script, the last dynasty, which is descended from Mongolian script, which is actually related to Aramaic script in some, you know, very like Syriac script a long time ago. So it actually is enough to tilt. So I also want to say that the fact that Chinese system, the, the writing system could have survived, is really kind of a miracle. And it's kind of remarkable because all linguists would tell you languages tend, sort, tend towards simplification. And on that view, I don't think Chinese writing system could have, could have survived. But it's really the sheer force of will and also how attached the Chinese are to their writing system, how much they believe it to be a core of who they are, their cultural tradition, that it managed to survive the 20th century and into the modern age as one of the most cutting technologies. Um, is it easier to learn now? Do contemporary technologies either being able to type it or write it on a screen or listen to recordings of it? Are the, is it easier to learn now? Well, it is so much easier to learn now that some people lament that people can't write characters by hand anymore. <laughs> I mean, I could type in a keyboard now and I'll see like my name pop up in all kinds of different ways. So I essentially I just need to know how to recognize the character I want, but I don't get to like write it out. I don't need to really memorize, you know, what order the strokes are written in, so on and so forth. And I also have to say that it also seems true that the world of language also, or communication, the world of communication is also kind of swinging back towards a more ideographic tendency. So, you know, one thing about, so pictographic writing, which is what people thought of, you know, Chinese ideographic writing, which is not true because only about 3% of Chinese characters are kind of pictographic, but nothing can be more pictographic than emojis which I should point out was basically starting in Japan, right? So the idea is that we're kind of, we're also not really typing anymore. You can talk to Alexa or Siri, you can kind of write out on a tracking pad. So I feel like technology, you know, technology was once in place to do things we couldn't do, right? But now that we can, it's kind of bending towards or reverting back to serving our more natural habits of communication. So I think that definitely the, the, the world of language is much more diversified. And in many ways, Chinese is kind of making its comeback in the modern world. Um, somebody asks, if I speak English, Mandarin, and Cantonese, do you think I'm trilingual or bilingual? I think you're trilingual. I'm a big, I'm a, well, I'm a big proponent of, you know, languages are all languages. And as this Yiddish linguist famously said, the difference between a language and a dialect is that a language is a dialect with guns. So, <laughs> so essentially whatever, or, you know, I, I'm paraphrasing, but it's really true that language is basically a dialect with, that's been standardized and has power. Um, we also have the question, what's the relationship between Manchu and Mandarin Chinese, if at all? I was curious about your comment about Manchu having Aramaic roots. What about Tibetan and Mongolian? Yes, so I actually talk about this in chapter one. This is actually a long, so basically, you know, the last dynasty in China was actually ruled by Manchus, which is an ethnic group. It's not Han Chinese, like what is now considered sort of ethnically Chinese Chinese. And they had their own writing system, but as with all other foreigners who ruled China, which there's only three times in history where that happened, they found it much easier to assimilate to Chinese writing than it is to impose their writing system on a mass, like the enormous empire that already used Chinese. So Manchu emperors were, were famous lovers of Chinese language and they would write, you know, they, they had a phonological system that they would use almost secretly to phoneticize Chinese so they can figure out how to learn how to pronounce it. So this Manchu phonology actually became the, the a rare phonological system that um, documented how Chinese sounds could be pieced together. So when my fake Buddhist monk in chapter one, the one that stole across the, the border and came back to the Qing empire, I'm not sure if I mentioned he was a fake monk. He disguised himself as a fake monk. Maybe I did. And so he actually then used that phonological, um, that phonological blueprint to assemble the sounds of the Mandarin phonetic alphabet. So that root, however, that source has long been forgotten until recently. Because you know, when you really think of the origin of the Chinese language, how can that be anything other than Chinese? So in a lot of ways in the books, also undo this myth of you know, kind of the pure origin of any language and how essentially China and the West had long been learning from each other and you know, long before they became foes. So in the big part of writing a book like this is also to show 
how alike they were rather than different, which I think is predominantly thinking today. Well, I really enjoyed the book and I want to give you a chance to hold it up because my copy is a galley and it's not yes. as lovely as the book actually is. Kingdom of Characters, The Language Revolution That Made China Modern. And uh, you can get it on our website or anywhere else you um, buy your books. And I really do recommend it. It is um, a huge amount of information, but really uh, compelling for a lay reader and for someone like me who doesn't speak any Chinese whatsoever. And thank you so much for spending the last hour with us, Jingzu. This has really been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I'm definitely going to come visit you guys in person. This is an awesome conversation. And, and thank goodness that there's all these language lovers out there. I love it. Oh, yeah. someone asked, what does Jing Su mean English? So let me just say quickly, my name, my whole name actually is a testimony to the kind of language invention I'm talking about. So Jing Yuan Su is my whole name and each part it abides by a different um, romanization system. So huh. J-N-G means peace or quiet is in pinyin, the standard system. Y-U-E-N, which means um, far or distant, is actually Wei Jile system, which is this older you know, system that you know, foreigners came up with, the Brits essentially for Chinese. And then my last thing, T-S-U, good luck with that. It actually supposed to be spelled S-H-I. It's by the sheer accident of migrate, or immigrating to this country that my mother actually just kind of made it up to represent. So it's a very uncustomary spelling. It's also unique. So I don't have to worry about anyone else going by my name <laughs> if we were to write a <laughs> book. Anyway, so that's kind of the, that's kind of my own linguistic adventure. Excellent. Well, it's been a pleasure and let us know when you make it down to Washington. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all for Thank being here. Good night. Great to, great to talk to you all.